Hello, everybody. Welcome to Stay Paid, the sales and marketing podcast from Reminder Media, where we talk about the actionable ideas to help grow your business so you can live a life of freedom tomorrow, but only if you take action today. My name is Joshua Stike, Vice President of Marketing here at Reminder Media. And with me, as always, is Luke Acri, President of Reminder Media. What is up, everybody? And today we have another great interview for you guys. Our guest today has been a keynote speaker at Gary Vaynerchuk's Agent 2020 event, Gamma International's LAMP 2018, and is the founder of the Millennials Leadership Network, a research, learning, and development organization bringing together opportunities for millennials and those aspiring to become stronger leaders in the workforce. He is a million-dollar roundtable qualifier and a frontline leader as a California-licensed insurance broker, in addition to being recognized as a rising star broker with the California Association of Realtors. And if that's not enough... To keep him busy, he also hosts the All Mindset podcast, which you can listen to at allmindset.com. Sina Azari, welcome to the podcast, brother. Wow, gentlemen, thank you. What are the thank you so much for the introduction? I was like (laughs) listening to this, and I'm like, man, if I didn't know who I was, I would have been like, this guy is like the jack of all trades, masters of none. No, man, this guy, you deserve so much credit. It's uh, just give you guys a little backstory of how we met. Um, Cena actually was a client of ours and still is. uh, But I actually called him after one of my sales reps had done the intro call. So in our sales process, we do this thing where, you know, a lot of times maybe you have a BDR business development rep who makes calls and tries to intro and warm up leads, but maybe they can't close the deal. So then I like to say the closer comes in. So I like to consider myself the closer, but I can't came in, talked to Cena, and this was, I don't know what, a year and a half ago, two years ago, and ended up, you know, Cena giving us a chance. And after that, I really didn't think anything of it, to be honest. I probably did a terrible job keeping up the relationship. You know, I moved on to the next deals, but Cena reached out to me and said and told me all about this idea of this conference he was going to host called the Disruptor. And in the conversations, you know, he just, you know, inspired me to be a part of this Disruptor conference, which, you know, how do you make sure you're staying relevant in today's world with all the changing technologies, especially social media. And so ended up doing that conference in California. And guys, check out staypaidpodcast.com because we will bring you updates on when the next Disruptor is. Just giving you a little plug for your conference, Cena, because it's amazing. And all of you should check out the Disruptor because it is an unbelievable conference of practitioners who are actually growing their business right now using social media and they're teaching you how to do it. But that's where we really, really got together. And I knew at that moment, just watching Cena put on this conference, learning more about his business, Present Financial. And I knew, hey, we got to get this guy on the show because I want you to share kind of your 30,000 foot backstory Tell people who you are, give them kind of bring them up to speed on who you are, what you've done, what you're doing now. And then let's dive in to some of the tangible strategies you've used to grow your business and really where you think the future is for, you know, insurance professionals, real estate agents, financial advisors. So tell us a little bit, tell our audience, introduce yourself, tell us your backstory and how you got here today. Awesome. Well, thanks, Luke. And uh, Josh, I appreciate again that introduction. Um, I, I ventured into financial services back in 2003. I was a 23 year old, uh, college graduate out of San Francisco State University. So shout out to the Bay Area, all those in the 415 in the peninsula. But, uh, I graduated with a degree in physiology and my goal was to pursue dental school. But after applying to several schools and not getting accepted, I found myself uh, sort of looking at this degree that meant so much to me personally, but to the business world really wasn't applicable. Mm. I was able to potentially go start at a a pharmaceutical company or maybe a research company, Genentech, et cetera, uh, doing some uh, research and development work and climbing my way up. But that that wasn't, uh, you know, aspiring me to want to pursue that direction. So I got recruited by a insurance agency or an insurance company named Bankers Life and Casualty. Uh, the branch manager there, shout out to her, Roya Mohammadi. She introduced me to the industry. She actually sponsored my license when I was 23 nice. years old. And, and if she wouldn't have made that investment in, in me, which I'm always, uh, grateful and will, will, will always be, I would not have been able to build this, build this career because I didn't have any money to pursue even paying for my license. But, you know, and, and every time I share this story, it reminds me to take a risk on someone, you know, because there's so many individuals out there that are scared to take a risk on someone. And 
Um, that was a big turning point for me. So I started the financial services business when I was 23, worked with Banker's Life for, for a stint. And after, uh, you know, really generate some good income by my second year, I was making some good money in the business. Uh, my mom, she was a big influencer and said, Hey, you know what, Cena, you should uh, go and invest some of your money in real estate. And I was like, all right, well, you know, I don't have that much to build this portfolio. She said, no, go get your first house. And then slowly you build some equity, you pull some money out, you do it again, et cetera. And then that's how investors grow. But when I came to pursue that, uh, one of my challenges was I said, I don't have the, you know, enough to live the life that I was living at the same time, carry a down payment on a decent home. Now, mind you, this is in the Bay Area. And right now, if th- those of you who aren't in real estate, San Francisco is the most expensive land value in the United States today. And in 2003, it was second to, to Manhattan or, or downtown New York. And now it's taking the number one spot. But wow. we, I recall we, we ended up putting a down payment on a $430,000 studio, uh, in downtown San Francisco. $430,000 $430, studio. <laughs> In 2003, in 2003, oh my gosh. and the, uh, I remember the address because the people who, who, who remember or were investing in real estate during that time, this was such a hot property. It was 88 Townsend Street. It was across street from the, from the AT&T ballpark where the Giants play. And uh, they, they refurbished or rehabbed the inside of this historical building from the 1800s that survived the fire. And they marketed genius style out of it to where there was a line of people sleeping out front trying to get in on the first three phases because it was only a three phase development. That's all. Awesome. And my mom, I love this woman. Uh, she, she, I mean, single raised by a single mom. She said, Cena, you gotta go and get one of these properties and just flip it to have some money for the home you want to <laughs> live in. And, uh, you know, she figured, Hey, you're 20, 20, I was, I think 24, 25 at this time, a year and a half, two years in the business. She said, go sleep outside, hold your spot until they release the phase. I kid you not for three days. We slept out there. At that time, my fiance, uh, Sarah, she's, you know, we're now married, but she was with me, supporting me because she wanted to obviously go in on this home with me, our first home together. And, uh, Starbucks was doing a campaign. Domino's Pizza was bringing pizza. The news channels were there and they all helped me and all the first three phase owners buy this property that majority of them still probably live there or, or stayed in there. But me, I was the one that three months after it was developed, I took the keys, handed over to the next buyer. And we made about 40 grand in that 90 day period. And that was the beginning. That's so, amazing. Going back though, my challenge was getting this down payment. She said, Cena, go get your, your real estate license and use the commission from the developer to help pay some of your down payment. I was like, I love this. <laughs> <laughs> so fast forward now, about 15 years later, um, I'm an insurance broker. So we contracted with about 120 different companies with present financial partners. Uh, vice president of development and, and leadership out there building the company. At the same time, uh, I've uh, acquired my broker's license in the state of California with the BRE, which is now, I'm sorry, the DRE, the, the Department of Real Estate. Yep. And we have uh, introduced a real estate brokerage named Present Financial Properties. That is the real estate arm of Present Financial Partners. I love it, man. I love it. It's amazing. It's amazing your mom that you had. I mean, just pushing you like that. And it's just so, it's funny when you look at like entrepreneurs and it's all, they all have a similar story, which is just taking that risk and having no idea how it's really going to work out, but it takes someone taking a chance on you, like you said, and pushing you. Is that why you started just curious before we jump into building present financials? Is that why you did the millennial network, which is you're really investing in millennials? Is is that really what encouraged you? You know, um, I, right now, I, one thing that I've recognized is I'm, I'm on the oldest, the, the, the oldest year of millennials, if people would consider that. Uh, well, I think I'm, we're I'm the zennials now. You're yeah. the zennials. Hey, man, listen, listen, I'm, I squeeze myself with the millennials, man. I'm 38 years old. This is the largest demographic to ever hit the, the, the United States and potentially the globe. There's 2.1 billion millennials globally, 92 million in the United States, and I'm seeing two shifts that most might be observing but ignoring or don't even see it at all. The first is that this millennial generation is the strongest and they're also in significant debt to where this is school debt, unfortunately. Yeah. They're coming out with these degrees. I got a degree, so I'm not bashing on anyone who, who goes to school and doesn't apply it or, or, or thinks it's everything. But you come out of college, you owe all this money and you've lost four or five years of opportunity yep. to only define yourself leading towards an entrepreneurial route because today those degrees don't carry the weight that they did 20 years ago. And millennials aren't settling for 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars of income. They're not. Right. Mm. So, so I want to see this large group that is going to be entrepreneurs 
and they need leadership. They need support. And the second piece is, um, you know, if, if I could pay it forward and give back, I would have loved someone to have been able to help prevent or help me guide me through preventing some of the mistakes that I made due to lack of experience in entrepreneurship. Mm. And that's the purpose of Millennials Leadership Network. That's awesome. That's awesome. Where can they find that? If they're a millennial listening to this, where can they find that? Go to www.millennialslead.com. Millennialslead.com. And, and we'll, hopefully we'll put you guys that. can all spell it. Yeah, Thank you, man. Thank we'll you. put yeah, we'll put uh, that well, in the not, show not, notes. Not you, but, but a lot of these millennials can't spell millennial, man. No, no disrespect. <laughs> we'll put that in the show notes at stateaidpodcast.com so you guys can find that. So you talk about wishing that someone would have helped you uh, because yeah. of all the mistakes you made as an entrepreneur. So let's talk about that because a lot of our people listening to this, they're entrepreneurs. They're real estate agents, insurance agents, financial advisors trying to grow their business. You know, looking at present financial. So how long has present financial been around? Present Financial, I don't know if, you, if we can still call it a startup, but yeah. we just hit our two-year anniversary. Congrats, we just hit our two-year man. anniversary last month. Two years. So how long is a startup? How yeah, long know, is we, a startup? We've been around for 15. Yeah, we still, still call like ourselves a startup. A startup. Yeah, it's, <laughs> we, we say it's, it's more mentality. of an attitude. Yeah, 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 attitude mentality. We're on the same page, guys. <laughs> it's kind of like you still think you're a millennial, you know? <laughs> Hey, come on, man. Come on, man. I'm just messing with you. But let's talk about, you know, present financial. So you start this company. What was your motivation to start your own company? And then you what? Know, uh, I, 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 actually, I, I have to give credit to the, the founders. The founders okay. are Sarah Adele Zade. Yep. Uh, Sarah Adele Zade really headweighted this deal. Um, she is the founder. She's Love it. 17 years in financial services. She is a millennial, 35 year old female leader in financial services. She had this vision behind present and really led this direction. And I was the third or fourth uh, of the leadership team to join and say, hey, let's really take this thing across the country. Love it. Love it. So what has been the biggest challenge? So you come from Banker's Life, you're established, right? And now you're coming into yeah. a no-name company that doesn't have any brand awareness right. or anything like that. That's where a lot of our entrepreneurs are, right? So they have no brand awareness. They're starting fresh. What did you do to start generating business. I'm sure you brought some business over with you probably from Banker's Life, but what did you do to really attack to spread the brand of Present Financial? You know, um, just just to add a little detail, we have we have a we have a non or had a non compete with Banker's Life, which in California they don't apply, but out of respect for the company for what they did for me, I really I didn't bring any business over. Wow. And um, one thing that I did observe before I made the shift and, and move over is Banker's Life and many of the larger insurance carriers, great companies, but they're being led and still marketing the way we used to prior to the new era. And when I say the new era, specifically the last 10 years, everything that we are involved in today technologically didn't exist just 10 years ago. Mm. But most of these companies are still operating as if these tools and platforms don't exist. So for me, it was a matter of saying, hey, I'm either going to, I mean, I don't want to say it negatively, but I'm either going to end up dying with this company that, in my opinion, was already starting to die in their strategy, or I'm going to get uncomfortable and lead the initiative of how the industry needs to start marketing. Oh, that's powerful. And uh, we're, starting to see, we're starting to see a big shift. I mean, the average age of an advisor in financial services is 55 years old. In my opinion, that's very young. But as far as technologically advanced, no. Uh, 55-year-olds in general, they're not engraved in, in web design, social media, and connecting the way we all do today. So you're basically taking the strategy. One, I love the statement that you made is that you had to get uncomfortable or you're going to die. And that's the truth, man, is if you're not uncomfortable, you're not truly living, baby. So I love that. I love that statement. But here's the, I guess what I want to touch on is you're saying you started marketing in a new way which is what you're yeah. hinting at is using social media and the technology that's available now to grow present financial. Can you give us some details of like how you've gone about growing your social media? And let's talk about like the platforms that you like to use the best and are you getting leads from it? But you know, how did you go about that process? Sure. Well, let me share with you in general, most, um, of the old school leaders or executives that are building the business and their brand, they're unfortunately, I believe a little bit intimidated or threatened by competitors in the same industry and same segment. 
And one thing that I wanted to do as an executive and as a leader is instead of being threatened and push back the competitors was I felt that if we came closer and start to work together and share ideas, not internally, but industry wide, then we could start to strengthen our relevance in the industry as leaders and as brand uh, creators or, or developers. So one thing that I wanted to do was, which has helped, it's not only social media, but using these platforms, I immediately, when I left Bankers and joined as an executive with Present, was I reached out to all of the executives of uh, these large billion dollar carriers. One is as a broker, we contract with 120 of them. So they see value in Present and that relationship was easy to build. But second, all the, the larger carriers that are considered captive where they only offer their own product, I still initiated relationships with them and, and sort of brought them into my circle and said, hey, I think that we can all make an impact if we start to work together instead of trying to conceptualize small on what we could do internally within our companies. And that's really what I think was new to the industry, that people were like, wow, we got we finally have someone that's not threatened by someone else's success. Wow, that's actually um, it's so funny because when you usually get into business, you usually don't talk to the competition at all. You literally have almost like a battle against them. You're doing the complete mm-hmm. opposite, which is you're almost Correct. you're embracing the competition and saying, hey, look, yes, we compete. But if we Correct. join together as forces, we actually are spreading the relevancy of why someone needs an insurance agent, why someone needs a real estate agent versus going at each other, more speaking to each other and helping us spread the word. I love that. So you're talking and you're touching on something that I think you're incredible at. And I don't know if you know this or not, but and probably someone has told you before, but you are an incredible networker. And what you did that. right there in, in that strategy for people who are listening, if they didn't pick this out, what he did right there is he really networked. So, yes, he used the cause of going, hey, let's join together, even though we compete against each other for the same client. Let's join together on this greater cause of people still need an insurance agent. And you use that cause as a way to network with other people that now they think of you in a positive light. And guess what? If they have a referral, because a lot of like real estate agents, they'll refer business. I don't know in the insurance world if you guys do the same. Absolutely. Right. So so you networked. I don't even know if that was your plan necessarily. But have you seen networking being the crux of what's helped you grow present financial, your ability to connect with people? And then have you used social media to do that? Uh, Absolutely, Luke. Um, One is social media has helped present financial become a nation brand. Second, by connecting with all the executives of our competitors, immediately I introduced to them who present is instead of them either hearing from it in the future or not knowing the people behind the deal. And I'll tell you my philosophy behind it, behind bringing competitors together like this is you, you mentioned something um, that most people will resonate with. You said that most of the time when you go into business, you kind of, I guess, stay as far away from your competitors or, or you, you said something along the lines you of go to war. isolation. You, of yeah. You war. basically, you go to war. You go to war. Perfect. You, you, well, well said. So the way I, I, I see it today and it's, I believe it's going to work is, this is the trend of where everything's going. Information is so accessible to people now that you can't hide. And companies that um, were putting on this facade about their culture, their product, uh, their customer service, before it was very difficult to uncover the truths behind any yeah. fabrications. Now it's all accessible. So what I did by, by engaging with these other carriers, companies, and ex- executives was – I came to the table and said, look, this is what we offer. They said, this is what we offer. And eventually what we're doing is we're, we working together, sharing best practices are constantly elevating our own game, our own culture, our own ability to keep attracting new talent because they're only making us stronger and we're hopefully providing the same value. That's awesome, man. So where do most of your leads, as you're trying to grow your business, uh, present financial, right? So you have the real estate side, you have the insurance side. Where are you guys getting most of your leads from? Well, um, we the, the financial services side, uh, which is what present financial partners originated as a financial services provider, part of a financial advisor's role or insurance advisor's role is to do a very good needs analysis, similar to a physician would with their patients. And every professional advisor in the insurance and financial space asks 
about real estate. They have to. If they really want to protect their assets, if they want to find where there's expense, uh, expendable income, where there's expenses, uh, any tax incentives, et cetera, you ask about real estate. And if you're, if there's advisors listening to this and you consider yourself an advisor, either life insurance or financial advisor, a series, uh, you know, variable advisor, and you're not asking or uncover real estate needs, then you're not doing a full needs analysis. And in our shop, uh, even the company that I came from, all the agents were educated on how to properly uncover real estate assets. Now, why? In the financial services, it's because now we have more assets to hedge risk against. We have more assets to protect from unknowns, et cetera. But then that one segment of real estate gets shut down. There's no uncovering it. There's no, well, are you going to downsize, upsize? Do you want to add to your portfolio? Do you want to manage your property? Do you want to rent it out, et cetera? And I said, you guys, why are we allowing uh, Berkshire Hathaway, Century 21, um, broker XYZ to come in. And those names I just mentioned are, again, great companies. I'm friends with a lot of the leaders of these organizations. But instead of allowing them to come in and maybe referring our client maybe to their financial advisor, to their insurance agent, why are we not offering this full service in-house? And we couldn't find one client to object to this when we uncover the needs as an insurance agent and then plant the seed that we also do financial services. I'm sorry, real estate services. Then on the flip side, our real estate agents right now, they help someone with a home or an additional investment property. Guess what? Let's now review your insurance needs. Mm. You have more, you have more liability to protect against from loss of income, et cetera. They go hand in hand. Yeah, it's a brilliant model. And I model. believe the future, you're going to see this. The future is going to be more blended models mm. just like this. And we have, we have named this. We have uh, founded uh, the first career broker agency. And I love Josh's smile right there because that's another one you got to add to that. We are the founders of the Career Brokerage Agency. I love it. That's a great model. So I love how you're leveraging the asset you already have to grow your business because I think a huge mistake that so many people make, we've made this at Reminder Media, is when you go to grow your company, you don't leverage the true asset that's right in front of you that's actually dictated or determined by the needs analysis that you talk about. And you go off and you try to do something cool that maybe your competitor's doing or you think it's the hottest, latest, greatest thing instead of looking and going, man, what's right in front of me that I have the asset right in front of me and the pain point and need that my client is saying and screaming to me, I think that's amazing and it's a great tip for people. If you're looking to grow your business, what asset do you have right now that you can leverage to provide more value to your client? Now, let me ask you this because this is a huge discussion point that I think is all over the web right now is this on-demand economy and this convenience economy to where people want, I always say it's like the easy button from Staples. People just want that mm -hmm. easy button. Now, is mm -hmm. you doing present financial, it's that convenience model that you're talking about. Do you find when you guys are growing your business from a sales pitch perspective, because I think this would be really valid for our listeners, are you pitching to your clients and to your prospects the convenience of having everything in-house, easy, turnkey to use? Is that your value proposition? Well, you know, it, it depends on how we come across the prospect. We, we market to attract prospects specific to financial services, and our initial introduction to them is present financial partners, our financial leg, financial services leg. Then we also have a marketing team that is marketing specifically for property management, real estate services, buy, sell, uh, rent, lease, et cetera. Those individuals are introduced to us as present financial properties. Then once the relationship is established and we take care of the primary need that initiated the relationship, we respectfully introduce the additional services okay. that we also offer. Because that's a good point. Because as if I was listening to this as a entrepreneur and a salesman myself, yeah. I would be wondering, okay, is Cena selling the model of this convenience factor or is he still selling one product and then doing the upsell to keep the relationship? And it's the upsell model that you're doing. I think that's super cross important sell. for our it's listeners. Actually, it's, a, yep. it's, a cro it's a cross sell. Yes, Luke, cross, cross sell. sell. Yes, I love it. Love it. So let's get into... You, 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 do, you do the upsells, brother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's Luke's get, always selling. Yeah, I'm always selling Everything something. That's closer, terrible. Man, closer. Let's, closer. Let's talk about this all mindset, right? 
because one of the yeah. things that I know you for is that you are crushing it on social media. You are really a huge evangelist for making sure that your people in your industry are getting up with the times and using social media to grow their business. You have this sub company called All Mindset, right? And I'm curious to know that how is social media affecting and growing your business in all mindset? Did you create it, this content media company to grow present financial? Are you seeing the synergies? Would you encourage our listeners that they should be getting into media and content creation? I know it's a loaded question, but I think it's super relevant because you got to, I love it when I look at you the media and content you're doing, and then you also have this practical business, service-based business and insurance and real estate and finance. So tell us a little bit about that. Uh, You know, it's, I I smile and I laugh as you, as you say this to me, because all mindset was created years ago. Uh, It was created years ago and it evolved. And the, the way all mindset was created was when Twitter first came out, um, you know, people were creating these handles and I didn't want to create a handle with my first name. I thought it was going to be boring. And I said, here's your chance to sort of be somebody other than who you are. And now I didn't know where Twitter was headed. Now, I mean, in hindsight, I I wish I was Sina Azari and I'm CEO accredited. And that's, uh, that's a whole nother story of how that came about. (laughs) Choose your handles appropriately. I, 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 I claim, exactly. You're right. So I claimed all mindset and I claimed all mindset because uh, I went through the, the trials and tribulations of, um, you know, the entrepreneurship stages of, of obtaining success from zero clients starting from scratch. And I credited all of it to my mindset. So all of my friends, uh, some of the other uh, peers I had and industry network connections I had, they would connect with me. And as they would exchange their challenges, obstacles, whatever, I would coach them through it. And at the end of almost 95 percent of our conversations, it would end it with you're right. My mindset was wrong. I got to change this personally, internally. It's up to me. And um, that's where All Mindset, it was just an appropriate name. And as uh, I was using All Mindset to just share motivational material of how I felt at random on tweets, uh, it, it transitioned to when as this whole media and marketing era has evolved and it's continued to, ev- to evolve, you always got to be ahead of the game. We went from posting pictures to uh, posting videos to live stories to now, uh, you know, IGTV is the newest thing, hottest thing with channels out there. But I think they're so short lived. The actual trend was going to voice. Hmm. It was going to voice. Yeah. And I said, you know what? All mindset media sounds perfect to start and launch a podcast. And what do I want to do with this podcast? What's the relevance? It's not about present financial partners for all mindset. It's not about present financial properties. Yes, we do have a studio in the office that, that we use conveniently, but all mindset is really to help entrepreneurs in all landscapes of building their business have another outlet to get their voice out to other listeners, other entrepreneurs, other like-minded folks, other clients that might be looking up or searching relevant ads that, that applies to their business. So all mindset was a, was a podcast, a transition to a podcast platform to help entrepreneurs grow. Now, have you seen or had business come through your all, all mindset channel that's translated to uh, business it, it, and it present has. financial? I love that. It, it, it has, it has from, from, from the relationships. Yep. You know, the first thing is people come to, to the studio and they're kind of like surprised because they see a financial services. Plus, I also thought it would be neat to have a podcast in a financial services office. <laughs> it's got a it cool is, sword you know, on the wall. That, that, it's a, it's a sweet studio, me. man. Sweet, sweet studio. That has, thank you. So, so that has, ha, ha, it hasn't happened before. So, you know, we, we always got to take the risk to, you know, be creative, innovative and learn from the things that don't work and keep building on things that do. And that was one of the risks that I said, you know what, guys, starting 2018, January, we're kicking off the podcast. And instead of calling it present financial or, or, you know, XYZ relevant to the company we're in, we're, I'm just going to give up the all mindset brand to, to build this media. Company. Dude, I love it. I think there's a key point in there that you have made that's so relevant for our audience, which is it was all about just adding value 
right? It was all about just giving back to the community. And then what translated to deals for your business were relationships. Relationships, And every deal comes back to relationships. We scream it. It's what our company's all about is you got to build a relationship and consistently keep up with that relationship. And it will translate to business because they know they like you, they trust you. So we got two more questions for you, man. It's been an awesome interview. So one of my questions is, is there a routine that you do every day? Are there three to five things? And the number's not as important as it are. Is there a routine that you do every single day that you attribute to helping you be successful? Uh, I do. Uh, the first thing is I, I sleep and wake up and live 24-7 with gratitude. Uh, I am, I'm extremely grateful of all the smallest things. And it's so weird because Uh, I'll even like, I'll just be washing the dishes randomly. And my wife looks at me and says, why are you smiling? Why is there green? I said, I don't know. It's kind of, it's kind (laughs) of weird because I hate washing dishes, but I'm grateful that I'm able to wash these dishes right now. And she's like, Cena, you're like, she says, Cena, you're such a weirdo. You're so crazy. (laughs) And I said, I don't, I I said, I don't know, Sarah, next time you do the dishes, why don't you smile and do them and then see if it feels better than not. And she she really really wasn't, she wasn't feeling that comment. Yeah. But going back, (laughs) I could have told you that one of my must things is, um, I, I, I'm always grateful. So the first day I wake up, I wake up with this significant feeling of gratitude and it continues through brushing my teeth. I mean, it's, it sounds weird, but I'm like grateful to brush my teeth and look at myself brushing them. Um, and I recommend people start to start to zone in on the gratitude because so many folks are focused on all these things they're aspiring to achieve. Unfortunately, it's usually things mm. that uh, money's tied to it, correlated to it. And all these small things that are the most important, when you imagine not having those small things, you'll recognize how big they really were. Mm. Mm. And I focus on all those small things that gives me, and, and that gives me this fire. So like right now that I'm looking at two professionals of Reminder Media, a 30 plus million dollar organization by two really, really aggressive, successful businessmen. And I'm given the opportunity to speak to you guys on your podcast, like that level of gratitude is so motivating to me that that's the first. The second is um, I, I got to walk my dog every day. I got to get him out there because I think he gets me out there. First thing in the morning, kind of dog? you get that sun or, 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 or you get the cold if it's cold or misty, whatever it is, those feelings and sensations, they fire me up for whatever the rest of the day is going to bring my What way. kind of dog do you have? Um, every, I, I got a husky, man. I got a husky. Oh, Love it. The guy's super, beautiful super dogs. vocal best dogs uh the only problem is they shed a lot but it's all good you just gotta get a lot of those <laughs> you gotta <dogs>. have gratitude <laughs> about that shedding <laughs> hey yay hey, fur in the house and i don't know what to tell you <laughs> uh i believe in meditation I, I i believe in uh 10 to 15 minutes of um either listening to some meditation or just pure silence where you are talking to yourself and i know it sounds weird it sounds crazy but i i, I reevaluate my day, if I do it in the evening, and most of the time I do it at night before I go to sleep with, with a clear conscience to, to sort of dissect what my day was like. And I just break it down. I break it down from what it started like to where it went, uh, all the motions and things that if I could have made a tweak to make sure to tweak if it presents itself. Um, I also absorb a lot of content. I do that every day. Hmm. The, the content varies, uh, you know, from Gary Vaynerchuk, to Tom Ferry, the real estate guru out there and a good friend, and Tony Robbins, one of my mentors from the age of eight. I just consume these guys' material plus the uh, individuals that I come across in my feeds and my network like stay paid. Yeah. You know, take action. That's another, that's another segment. Um, that, that, you know, this type of consumption, I, I, I don't, uh, consume I don't want to sound like, like as if it's not important, but I, I, it doesn't matter to me what people ate for breakfast. It's not a big deal what, what vacation spot people went to. It doesn't matter to me that someone was flying private and the other guy wasn't. That stuff right. is, is, is exciting for those individuals, not for me. What for me is what can I look, listen, and put my time and energy into that's going to provide me value? That's awesome, man. Because that's what I want to provide. Dude, I love I it. Do, I, those are the things that I must do all the time. That answer to that one question is worth the whole podcast. So people should definitely you, stick you around guys, to listen rock, to that. Man. Dude, man, that, that gratitude statement, man, that was that <laughs> gave me chills. That was awesome, man. So next and final question is knowing what you know now, right? Because you have had years yeah. of experience. 
what would you do differently? And and try to gear your answer towards, you know, you're speaking to an audience of entrepreneurs, to insurance agents, real estate agents, financial advisors, you know more than even us, the ups and downs of that business. What would you do differently? And where would you maybe not throw your effort? And where would you throw your effort 10x? Looking back. Uh, a couple of things. One is uh, never take the advice of anyone that you wouldn't trade shoes with. And there's so many people out there that are just excited to tell you what to do, how to do it, or talk about their success from years ago. And that's how they used to do it, et cetera. Scratch that out. And when I was brand new into entrepreneurship, I didn't know any better. So I was listening to some of these folks. And I think some of, some of that listening um, might have delayed some of the time of my success. The next thing is uh, act. Act uh, immediately. In other words, don't don't sit there and keep thinking the what ifs. Amen. Uh, it's I would much rather and I'm always looking for leadership to join an organization. I would much rather bring on a leader that acted and made a mistake than never took action at all, because I believe that we will always learn through our failures and uh, there is no losing. You know, I believe in uh, Maxwell. Maxwell always says it's some win, some learn. I'm a big believer in that. And I, I, I if I could go back, I would have acted a lot quicker. I would have jumped sooner. I, I wouldn't have been so scared of thinking about all the wrong things that can happen and instead would have lived like today. I, I live as close as to the edge as I can of failure as possible mm. because the closer I am to failure, the more I'm growing, the more new, creative, exciting opportunities are presented to me because I'm so willing to get out there and be uncomfortable. Guys, man, that man right there just spoke some truth. That is the truth. I mean, seriously, hashtag that, quote that. But it is. It's it's absolutely the truth. I've had the privilege of working with millionaires. I've had the privilege of working with people who make $30,000 a year. And the truth is what differentiates the successful from the non-successful is action. There's no doubt about it. That is the key. Love absolutely. It, absolutely. So there you have it. A great story and some great lessons from an entrepreneur who was out there practicing these networking and social media tips in his own business and most importantly, taking action every single day. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for being here, Cena. Yes, thank you. We really you. enjoyed Gosh. it. Before we close out, uh, I know we mentioned some of the places, but please uh, tell people where they can connect with you. Uh, you guys can find me out there on LinkedIn, Cena Azari, and all my social media handles are under the name CEO Accredited. All right. And absolutely make sure to check out all mindset.com slash podcast. Look for episode 50. You might see some familiar uh, faces and some names <laughs> on that one. I think hey, it was man, a great episode. That, that, <laughs> that 50 is a very special episode that a, for us. I thought that's what got us thrown up on iTunes. 50 got us thrown up on <laughs> iTunes. Yeah. So that's I, destiny, I, I'm man. grateful to you guys. It was yeah. I'm grateful to you guys. Awesome. If you liked yeah. what you heard, please consider giving us a five-star rating on iTunes and leaving a comment. To get new episodes weekly, subscribe to Stay Paid in your favorite podcast player. Make sure to follow Reminder Media on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We also post weekly coaching videos on YouTube. You can search for Reminder Media and look for a, the Above the Noise series there. Thank you again, Cena, for this episode of Stay Thank Paid. You, I'm Joshua Stike. And I'm Luke Acre, guys. And I'm going to close with this. You know, listening to this whole interview, it's inspired me, but it really touched me was that gratitude statement that he made. Is the action that you should take this week in your business is Start writing down a list of what you're thankful for. Imagine if every day this week you took action on writing down the five things you're most thankful for and put your mindset into perspective to help you maybe take the next hill that you're up against. So guys, take action on this that week or this week. Take action on this. The difference between a top producer and a mediocre producer is top producers take action. So take action today on that to stay paid, baby. 